Midsommar was a total blast to rewatch. It's one of those movies where every time you rewatch it, you capture an entirely new perspective on its meaning, and you find several super subtle details that you never saw before. It's wonderful. There's so much integrity and passion coming from Ari Aster in every single scene of his movies. And for these two films to be his debut and sophomore, I don't even know what to say. I just hope he's working on something new because he's amazing. So welcome to Classic Explained episode 14, Midsommar. To break it down, similarly to the Hereditary video, we're gonna use two really big themes. One, fairy tale of agony, where we'll discuss the film's inspiration, the central meaning of the movie, the opening mural, Danny's destiny, Pell and the Harga people's plan, the wall illustrations, Pell's backstory, Christian's selfishness, Danny's trauma, and the Harga's togetherness. Two, the Harga commune, where we'll discuss Harga's inspiration, the Fulark language, the runic alphabet and its symbolism, the cliff jumping ritual, inbreeding and xenophobia, Ruben symbolism, Christian and Maya's sex scene, the Midsummer Festival, and the ending with Simon's death, Josh's death, Connie's death, Mark's skinning, and Christian's bear costume, and much more. And if you like this video, please leave a thumbs up and a comment, it helps so much. And if you want to see more of these, please make sure to subscribe as well. Let's get started. <laughs> Theme number one, fairy tale of agony. If you watch any of Ari Aster's press interviews for this film, you'll learn that the writing of the script for this movie was inspired by a really tough breakup. And Ari actually uses classic romantic comedies as an inspiration, like Modern Romance from 1981. In an interview with Vox, he reveals another very interesting inspiration for this film, where he says, I've always seen Midsommar as a fairy tale. Orphaning your main character is the oldest fairy tale move in the book, and that was important for where the film goes. So immediately, I think of happily ever after stories like Cinderella, and this all totally clarifies the whole point of the film, Midsommar, for me. And this is my interpretation of what this whole film is and means. The whole movie is a twisted, agonized, fairy tale revolving around the slow end of a toxic relationship and the fortunate discovery of a new loving family. This is showcased in the very first shot of the film, where we see this classic folktale fairy tale mural that actually summarizes the entire story. We see the family in the exhaust pipes with death looking over them. Christian comforts Danny as Pell observes, sketches, and studies them from above. Pell leads the group of friends to the commune. They indulge in their festivities, and Danny eventually becomes the May Queen. It's this twisted illustration of Danny's journey from the darkest part of her life on the coldest day of winter to the most prosperous day of her life on the hottest day of summer, which is summer solstice, also known as the Swedish title of the film, Midsommar also pronounced Midsummer. And to build further on this idea of the movie being a fairy tale, it seems like the beautiful ending to this movie, with Danny riding away on an elegant carriage and being crowned like Cinderella, is all destined to happen from the very beginning. And even every moment in this movie is being carefully planned by the Harga people. Very early in the film, we see Danny's photo at home with bright yellow flowers above it, foreshadowing the destined ending that we eventually see. Pell also mentions to Danny various times that he is most excited that she is coming on the trip. And once Danny arrives, one of the fathers says welcome to everyone very briefly, but to Danny, he slows down and he says, welcome home. We are so very happy to have you. The woman who is sacrificing herself also looks directly at Danny before she jumps off the cliff. The illustrations on the walls are also a prelude to every major event in this movie, which showcases that everything that happens here is all part of a Harga tradition and will happen the way it has all been planned. And it's this scene with Pell that confirms to me why Danny was the one chosen to be queen this year and become a permanent member of the commune. Pell says, my parents burned in a fire and I became technically an orphan. So believe me when I tell you that I know what it's like. Yet my difference is I never got a chance to feel lost because I had a family here where everyone embraced me and swept me up. And I was raised by a community that doesn't bicker over what's theirs and what's not theirs. That's what you were given, but I have always felt held by a family, a real family, which everyone deserves, which you deserve. 
And this immediately indicates to me that since Danny lost her parents and sister, and since her relationship is on the brink of ending, she is desperately in need of a family. Not a family like Christian and his friends, who really don't care very much about her as we see in this early scene. She was chosen by Pell in the commune so she would be given a new, loving family. And I think the fire that Pell says his parents burned in was the same kind of fire as the one at the end of the film. His parents were sacrifices, and Pell was passed on to the Harga commune as soon as they died. And this point of view kind of paints the Harga commune as the good guys, or the saviors. And this perspective also falls perfectly in line with the fairy tale story that this movie is making itself out to be. The Harga people represent everything Danny needs in a relationship that she is in no way getting from Christian. And here's what I mean. Danny is obviously traumatized by the death of her family. We see in multiple instances where Danny has nightmares of her family tragedy, fused with the imagery of the scarring things she's seen at the commune rituals. We also see these traumatic moments reappear during her drug trips. And Christian is the worst person for Danny to go to for support, love, and comfort. He clearly hasn't loved her for a long time, and he's quite unempathetic and selfish in general. He victim blames Danny, and she still desperately begs for his company, and she even blames herself for the issues in their relationship. So while Christian is extremely selfish, the Harger people are extremely selfless. Everyone in the commune refers to each other as brother or sister, even though they're not all completely related. We see the young women in the commune allow Danny to release her feelings of sorrow, frustration, and regret. And they all seem to be reflecting her expressions, as if they are all sharing Danny's pain. We also see them share the pain of the human sacrifices at the end of the film, as they all act as if they are burning alive. It all seems that the Harga commune lives by this code of reciprocity. There's always this equal give and take, this willing and optimistic compromise. Four sacrifices of outsiders, four sacrifices of us. New life is born, old life must go. And this is what leads to such a peaceful way of life for them. And this essentially is everything Danny needs. This is why Danny was chosen. However, this movie is not a perfect fairy tale. It's a twisted fairy tale. And these people do some very messed up things, which we will talk all about in theme number two, the Harga Commune. Harga is a commune located in Housingland, Sweden. The location is real, but it's a completely fictional commune created by the filmmaker, Ari Aster, who was inspired by Nordic mythology, Scandinavian folklore, and the Vikings that existed long ago in the Scandinavian region. The main language that Harga people write their scriptures and messages in is called Elder Fudark. This language uses the runic alphabet, where Vikings carved these angular letters into stone, which we see in the film. And every runic letter has a meaning attached to it. And the film uses the real meanings of these letters to symbolize the purpose of the characters and the scenes in the film. For example, Danny's tunic has the R looking symbol and the hourglass looking symbol. The R means journey or revolution. The hourglass means rebirth or reawakening. And when a symbol is backwards, it basically means the dark and unfortunate version of the original meaning. So a backwards R and an hourglass means to me a dark journey towards an eventual rebirth. And this is exactly what Danny goes through in the film. There's actually a really cool article by Radio Times that goes into way more depth with the symbols, but I'll cover the main ones because I don't want this video to be an hour long dominated by runic symbols, so I'll link it below. Pell wears the F, which means wealth and success, which I think is figuratively what the commune will be blessed with, with the sacrifices and the queen that he has provided, like wealth in terms of natural resources and physical health. Maya has the love rune since she's plotting for Christian to fall in love with her. And I won't go too deeply into this one, but basically all of these symbols mean journey, gifts, good fortune, protection, and prosperity, which are all the exact things that the Harga people are getting out of this age 72 cliff jumping self-sacrifice ritual. And while we're on this topic, this ritual is a reference to Scandinavian folklore. These are sites where elderly people were thrown off cliffs to their deaths during Nordic prehistoric times when an elderly person was no longer able to take care of themselves. There's also a lot of inbreeding in the Harger community, and this is a criticism of historical xenophobia in Sweden. In an interview with Nightmarish Conjurings, Aster explains how Harga does represent his criticisms over racism and xenophobia in Sweden. 
He also mentions how the white human sacrifices, like Christian and Mark, were each used to have a child, while Josh, Simon, and Connie were just killed. And overall, this political message is what the inbred Reuben character represents. He's the ironically ideal outcome of a perfectly pure race. That's why they call him the Oracle and say his thoughts are pure. And on the topic of the most shocking, eye-opening, jaw-dropping moment of the film that I just couldn't imagine being filmed and I won't show, of course, this Maya and Christian sex scene moment was very obviously a result of a hypnotism ritual used to convince outsiders to procreate with Hargo women. However, also, I don't think it was entirely hypnotism. It seems like Christian's always been attracted to Maya, which we see early in the film when he first makes eye contact with her and holds eye contact with her and is willing to leave Danny and join her in the game. I think this whole super shocking scene was the Harga people's strategy to reveal Christian's temptation towards infidelity and reveal this reality that Danny has always been in denial of to detach her from Christian and make her one of their own. And if you don't know what midsummer is, it's this yearly summer solstice holiday celebrated in Sweden and other northern countries. It includes dancing, feasting, bonfires, May Queens, and Maypole dancing, just like we see in this film. The particular festival in the movie is nine days long, and there are nine sacrifices that need to be made. And I think the significance of the number nine relates to nine significance in Norse mythology and Norse cosmology, where there are known to be nine different realms. So I guess now we can talk about the various deaths at the end of the film. Let's start with Simon. The Vikings had this execution ritual called the Blood Eagle, where the victim's back would be ripped open and they would be hung with their organs out, still alive, which is exactly what happens to Simon. Mark was skinned after having accidentally urinated on a sacred tree. I believe it was this guy who was wearing Mark's face when Josh was killed because he seemed the most upset about what Mark had done. It also ties in with a line earlier in the film where Ingmar mentions the kids are playing a game called Skin the Fool. Plus, in the end, we see Mark wearing a jester hat, confirming that he is the skin fool. Josh and Connie and the Harga sacrifices are either filled with branches and fruit, or have scripture paper stuffed in their mouth, or have photos attached to them. And I think these are the most Ari Aster inspired killing methods and don't have to do as much with Scandinavian folklore because it reminds me of the end of Hereditary so much. It seems to be an artistic trademark of his to manipulate body parts of corpses to give them new meaning for a big finale. The fruit, branches, scriptures, and photos attached to the victims are of course goods, sacred items, and precious Harga moments captured on camera, all being sacrificed by the Harga people in exchange for good fortune and internal strength. The bear suit at the end ties in with the painting at the beginning of the movie by a Swedish artist named John Bauer. The painting is called Poor Little Bear. And to me, this reference is an indication of Christian as a person. His lack of emotion and lack of empathy can be seen on the surface as masculine or unbreakable, but to its core, his selfishness and emotionlessness shows a lack of development and even cowardice. It's this idea of looking strong and powerful, but being very small inside and being very easily conquered by anyone with any level of humility, like Queen Danny. This is also why at the end of the film, the man says, Mighty and dreadful beast, with you we purge our most unholy effects. We banish you now to the deepest recesses where you may reflect on your wickedness. Christian is the unforgivable ex-boyfriend of this tragic breakup story, and the wicked, beastly, and unholy arch-villain of this fairy tale. And Danny is our prosperous queen who overcame hell to find her own safe haven for peace, reciprocity, and loyalty. Nothing Christian ever had a chance of giving her. All right, this is my analysis. Subscribe for weekly videos and please send me recommendations. The Witch is next in the series, which I'm really excited to get started on, but please let me know your thoughts, ideas, or questions about Midsommar because Ari Aster has a million minor details in his movies. I hope to see you again and thank you so much for watching. See you later.